from the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City. You're Inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution for global growth for more than 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism right here, right now, at the NYSE and at ICE's 12 exchanges and seven clearinghouses around the world. Now here's your host, Josh King, Head of Communications at Intercontinental Exchange. The weather outside is warming. It's time to put away the skis and snowshoes, and those on the trading floor of the New York Stock Exchange could be forgiven for glancing away from the stock ticker and stealing a glimpse or two at the scoreboard as baseball our national pastime returns. And here's a truth. We'll forgive them those glimpses from now until October, as long as a favorite team among the 30 in Major League Baseball are in the hunt for a playoff spot. And that means just about all of us. Tonight at City Field in Queens, it's opening day of the 2018 season, the 57th for the New York Mets against the St. Louis Cardinals. The Metropolitans finished the 17 campaign with a frustrating 70 and 92 record, a decline from 87 wins in 2016 and their 90 win pennant winning 2015 season. For the front office, that signals a rebuilding effort. Beginning with their skipper, Mickey Calloway takes over for Terry Collins and Sandy Alderson, our guest today inside the Ice House, has also added Jason Vargas, Todd Frazier, Jose Reyes, and Adrian Gonzalez to the roster. Building a major league team season after season bears striking similarities to trading stocks on the floor of the NYSE, a mix of analytics and human judgment to make the right moves at the right time. How does Sandy Alderson, a man renowned for introducing sabermetrics to baseball with the Oakland A's, balance the numbers with the real-world evaluation of on-field talent? We'll find out right after this. Inside the Ice House is presented this week by ICE Global Index System, or GIS. ICE's index families combine leading reference data, evaluated pricing and analytics, along with a track record in index provisioning spanning 50 years to deliver unique, cross-asset and best-in-class index solutions. The roots of modern baseball can be traced right here to New York City, where Alexander Cartwright codified the sport and founded the Knickerbockers Baseball Club. Cartwright worked early in his career right here on Wall Street, so it's no surprise that several brokers were members of the original Knickerbockers, including Henry T. Morgan, a member of the Morgan banking family. Today, you need to look much farther afield than a pool of stockbrokers to find talent for the ball field and use a lot more data to understand a particular player's five tools, speed, arm strength, fielding ability, hitting for average, and hitting for power. And in the sabermetric era, there are a hundred other variables that go into the decision to spend an owner's money and sign a ball player to a contract. Many credit Sandy Alderson with inventing the mysterious recipe, exposed somewhat by Michael Lewis's 2003 mega bestseller Moneyball, The Art of Winning an Unfair Game. The game hasn't become any fairer in the past 15 years, but Alderson, Dartmouth grad, Marine Corps officer, and Harvard lawyer, brings as much mastery to its nuance as any general manager in the game today. Will his 2018 Mets finally take the commissioner's trophy this November? Let's find out. Welcome to the Ice House, Sandy. Happy to be here. This, the yearly ritual, you've packed up all the gear at first day to field in Port St. Lucie, shipped it up Route 95 all the way to Queens. How did Florida feel this spring? Florida was great this spring. Uh, we, uh, we had terrific weather, um, not too humid, not too hot. Very little rain, didn't lose a game or a practice uh, to uh, poor weather. So from that standpoint, it was terrific. But uh, more importantly, I think that uh, with a new manager, uh, some new players, a new approach to strength and conditioning, and a variety of other uh, enhancements to the team, it was a great six weeks to see all of that come together. Uh, under Mickey Calloway's leadership. You have that special facility right next to First Data Field run by Mike Barwis. Are the players using that regularly or a different regimen? No, what happens uh, is many of them there are there in the off season. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons that we uh, 
instituted that program and our association with Mike was to be able to keep an eye on the players in the off season because in spite of what many people think, we don't dictate what they do in the off season. Uh, we try to monitor, we try to be supportive, we send people out to watch and uh, um, assess, but ultimately it's that day-to-day -day proposition of strengthening and conditioning that um, you try to get a handle on. So that, that facility in uh, St. Lucie is uh, one in which many of our players, minor league and major league, utilize in order to, uh, to uh, prepare for the regular season. But for us, it's a way of kind of gaining a little more control over what they do or don't do. The closest thing you might be able to get to Paris Island during a Marine Corps boot camp, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, pretty close. Mike's pretty uh, uh, demanding. But, uh, you know, the nice thing about Mike is he works with athletes uh, across the board. So right now, for example, he's working with several NFL uh, draft candidates to get ready previously to get ready for the combine and now to see where they get drafted. He works with hockey players, uh, so a variety, and he works for the, with the, the disabled. So he's got a pretty wide portfolio. Uh, you're just here ringing the bell, the closing bell at the New York Stock Exchange with your partners at First Data, NYSE, ticker symbol FDC. Now the second year of your 10-year deal for naming rights at Port St. Lucie, and they're expanding their presence at City Field. How vital are your corporate partnerships to creating that great fan experience, both across, Saint, uh, across spring training down in Port St. Lucie and now coming back to City Field? Well, having having uh, uh, sponsorship support is is uh, incredibly important. It's uh, uh, you know one element of our overall uh, gross revenues, uh, which ultimately get plowed back into the players and uh, support services and so forth. Uh, but also, it's uh, it's a way for our us to sort of co-brand, if you will, and um, uh, benefit uh, from the reach of our sponsors. Good example was last year when First Data uh, got the naming rights for the spring training facility, and it just happened to coincide with uh, the arrival of Tim Tebow. That's right. Uh, to spring training last year. So you were really talking about uh, the sort of three brands coalescing, First Data, the Mets, and Tim Tebow, who is a brand in and of himself. So uh, the synergies of that are incredible. Uh, you know, when we signed Tim Tebow, it was really – not that we thought he would enhance the Mets brand, but he would certainly expand the Mets brand. And I think that's true with respect to uh, First Data as well. Um, I mean, all of those wire photos of Tim, both in the batter's box and in the on-deck circle, with the First Data branding on the padding behind him, was, right. we just kept, every day, there was another shot of Tebow with the First Data logo in it. And, uh, you know, he's the, he's the one player... Uh, you know, of, of his experience in, in the game, who actually gives fairly regular interviews. Yeah. So when you have the backdrop with First Data uh, behind those interviews, it just, uh, I, I imagine the retweets and so forth are pretty spectacular. So that's just an example, I think, of, uh, of how the relationship can work. Let's go back a couple of years, Sandy Alderson. Here's that pitch from Familia to Dexter Fowler against the Cubs in 2015, propelling your team to that showdown against the Kansas City Royals. And strike three called. They haven't been to the World Series since 2000, and the Mets are on their way back. A sense of elation for you, I'm sure. What was the key to success in that team three years ago? Well, I think that uh, probably perseverance, uh, a little bit of luck. Um, you know, when we got to the trade deadline in uh, late July of 2015, we were several games behind the Nationals uh, in the standings. But we had gotten to the point over the previous few years where, you know, we thought that as an organization we needed to make a statement to our fans that we were going to go for it. And it wasn't as if the odds were in our favor at that time, but we had picked up a couple of relievers and we felt that if we were going to make a move at all, we needed to, to add a hitter. And fortunately, in the end, we got uh, Ioannis Cespedes and he went crazy uh, toward the end of 15. So it was that. It was a combination of, of the hard work of a lot of other players. But um, um, and. You probably don't recall, but leading up to that trade deadline, we had a misfire on a previous trade. We lost a horrendous game uh, in extra innings with uh, rain delays and so forth. 
So it was uh, it was an emotional roller coaster, and then we didn't make the trade for Cespedes until five or six minutes before the deadline. So uh, it was a great ride, and uh, unfortunately, uh, it ended after five games in the World Series. But it was a it was a great story. But as people like Roger Angel will always tell you, hope springs eternal when you head back <laughs> down to Port St. Lucie. And if you flash forward ahead three years, uh, this, 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 this time of year is all about expectations, the move north from Florida. And many experts are giving the Mets at least the winner of the offseason trophy, uh, including your hiring of Mickey Calloway. Why was, I mean, you went through so many people in your interview process. Why was he the right skipper at this time? Well, when we uh, uh, decided to change managers, and, and Terry Collins did a great job for us for seven years, but it's like any other business at some point, uh, there needs to be some leadership change. So we were looking for someone uh, who would fulfill several different qualities, and I broke those qualities up into two categories. One was professional ability, uh, you know, the, the ability to do the job. Uh, be a manager, push the right buttons, etc. But on the other side of the ledger were, were personal qualities that would um, inspire the players, uh, sustain the players over 162 games. And, and really, we focused on those softer uh, qualifications than, than those of the job per se. You know, we felt in Mickey's case that the credibility he would bring with him from Cleveland with his success with that pitching staff would be enough to give him the initial credibility necessary to uh, run with it. So, uh, you know, from my standpoint, I was looking for leadership. I wasn't looking for a guy who'd done it before, wasn't looking for somebody who had 35 years of experience. There are times for that, but I felt in, in this particular instance that um, we needed uh, something different. And, um, you know, I'm 70 years old, and uh, so... Being able to communicate is very important, and uh, I have to remind myself every day that most of my communication is with guys who are 35 or 40. And so <clears throat> um, it's great to have a lot of experience in the game, but it doesn't really entitle one to anything. You really have to kind of continue not to reinvent yourself, but to continue to adapt. Uh, I'm a military brat, and I moved every three or four years adaptation was my thing you know you knew friends knew this knew that but i think that's true in one's career also you constantly have to change given uh the changing environment and and uh and requirements of the 30 major league teams i can think of maybe two markets here in new york city and boston where the manager's ability to deal with the media is a paramount job qualification are you how do you contrast the styles but but between terry collins and mickey calloway in terms of dealing with the with the media juggernaut that's New York City? Well, I think the thing that they will have in common is authenticity. They won't have the same style, but they'll have a style that fits their personalities. Uh, I think Terry was that way. He was straightforward, a little combative. Um, uh, Mickey is more of a communicator and uh, thoughtful before speaking. But both of them very authentic for their personalities. They weren't trying to fool anybody. So um, I think that's the thing that they have in common. I think that's the thing that will be different. Mickey will be probably more cautious in what he says, um, uh, but uh, true to himself. We've been talking about the personal characteristics of your manager, but also in recent interviews, you've been talking a lot about the personal characteristics and character of some of the players that you've brought onto this year's team, Bes beside those five tools of what makes a physical player, mm -hmm. talk about some of the thinking that is behind your signings and the 25-man roster in terms of the type of individuals and people that are making up the 2018 Mets. Well, one of the first signings uh, of the offseason was um, uh, Anthony Swarzak, who was um, you know, a relief pitcher last year for the White Sox and the Brewers. Um, that had more to do with need than it did with uh, uh, any other sort of uh, consideration. But Anthony has turned out to be uh, very thoughtful, uh, engaging, a great teammate. And I, I can't emphasize the import enough the importance of being a good teammate. We're talking about 162 games. We're talking about 
six months of a regular season, maybe another month of postseason, together with two months of spring training. So you're talking about nine months out of the year that these guys are spending a lot more time together than they are with their families. So being a good teammate is incredibly important. And this is something that uh, often analysts, uh, the proponents of big data, will discount. You know, that it's all in the numbers right. and forget about the chemistry. And maybe the head is a sixth tool. Yeah. But I think that, uh, you know, something I read uh, that Mickey said the other day, I think it's really important to understand that the analytics get applied to a generic set of circumstances. But if a player isn't comfortable, if a player is responding to that circumstance differently than the analytics would predict, why? Because of emotion, because of unhappiness because of, uh, you know, injury, a variety of things, then the analytics don't apply. So <clears throat> we can never forget that uh, while the analytics are important, uh, so is chemistry and so is sort of the personal commitment that players have. One of the reasons guys have good years and bad years is just some years they're more committed than, than others for a variety of reasons. So anyway, um, uh, the second pickup was Jay Bruce. And Jay Bruce um, – very happy that he's back because, you know, Jay came in originally in a, in a uh, trade deadline deal, deal in 2016, didn't get off to a great start with the Mets, then was very good and instrumental in kind of closing it out in 2016 to get the wild card. Uh, but while he was with us, he never really felt like he was a Met because we had him for that short period of time. Then there's a lot of speculation that we wouldn't pick up his option, yada, yada, yada. Now he's got a three-year contract. He's coming back. He knows – uh, New York. He knows Mickey from Cleveland. Uh, he is, and he's he's been a great teammate, uh, very solid. And partly, he just goes out and plays every day. Uh, you know, he's got a good relationship with the players, but it's really leadership by example. He he walks the walk. He doesn't talk. He, he just he just uh, is a good example. Um, Jason Vargas, uh, Dave Island, new from Kansas City. Mickey uh, and Dave both recommended him very highly as an individual, um, as somebody who will give it all for the for the team. And um, you know, even recently when he was trying to decide whether to have surgery on his hand or not, it was about the team. Gee, if I have it now, uh, we've got guys stretched out and they can cover for me. If I wait and try to get through it, we won't have guys stretched out. That would be difficult, more difficult to fill that fifth spot, uh, constantly talking about the team. So I, I think those things are you know, incredibly important. And, and Todd Frazier, uh, you know, one, a great guy. Two, I, I, I just love to say Frazier. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Sandy, you were mentioning that you, uh, you're you a military brat. Uh, your dad, John, was an Air Force pilot. Yeah. He flew missions in three wars, I think, including yeah. World War II, uh, brought baseball into your life. He told a story I was reading about how you wouldn't be deterred from accomplishing a goal, including getting an autograph from Hank Aaron down in Columbia, South Carolina. I think you were at an exhibition game, and you're still pursuing him, and you actually threw the ball into his car to get the, get the ball signed. I mean, this is a guy who doesn't stop at a goal. If it was a an Hank Aaron autograph or any of these signings, how what are the what are the tools you use from the 162nd game and the end of the playoffs until opening day to make sure you've got the best roster you can? Well, what we try to do uh, is uh, have all of our decisions be in what I call information driven. It doesn't mean that you rely exclusively on the information, but I think you got to be um, well advised. So a lot of research, uh, a lot of analytical work, but ultimately, you know, boiling it down to a situation where we have the human input from scouts and so forth. So a lot of teams, in, you know, in baseball, there are a couple of uh, bromides. One is, you know, we're going to build through the farm system. Well, okay. Everybody says that. How are you actually going to do it? Execution is so much more important than, than the concepts. The concepts are pretty well understood. You know, when Moneyball came out, the whole idea of undervalued players with on-base percentage uh, evaporated almost overnight, the, the discount that had existed. Why? Because the information was then public and uh, uh, was also persuasive to people. So um, – so the concepts have a very short half-life. Um, 
but they can continue to have vitality. The question is, how do you take those concepts and, and uh, translate them into action? How do you implement those things? And that's about uh, personnel. It's about systems. It's about organization. It's, it's a hard thing to do consistently over time. But in any event, you know, building through the farm system, we all say it, and the question is how you do it. Well, in the same vein with analytics, we, we all say, well, we blend the analytics with the more subjective information from scouting. And, of course, the question there, too, is, okay, so how do you actually do that? I mean, how do you blend? Now, some teams uh, have gotten to the point, like I would say the Houston Astros, where they don't do a lot of blending. Most of it's analytical. And, you know, they have success they have some with success it. to yeah. show for it. Um, there are very few teams, if any, these days who are exclusively subjective, rely on scouting, don't do any analytics. But the key thing, like anything else, uh, how do you execute on that idea? How do you blend the two together? You might, in one instance, use analytics to whittle down 100 players to 10 or 15, and then you start looking at uh, character. You start looking at injury history. You start looking at a variety of other things. Um, but that's the fundamental question, and that's what we try to do in the off season: is figure out how to use the information to make a rational decision that also takes into account some of the more subjective uh, elements. Do you think that growing up as the son of such a technical specialist as a fighter pilot helps you in kind of this process of going through all of the mechanics of checking these lists before you make a decision on a player? Uh, I don't think so, <laughs> only because my dad was not what I would call an organized uh, technician. Uh, he was more of a seat-of-the-pants uh, kind of guy, which can also be instructive. Um, you know, sometimes kids go in the, you know, the other direction. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm as well organized as I as people believe I am. Um, I do try to sort through ideas. Um, there are other people in our organization, John Rico and others, who are far better at follow up than I am. But um, you do have to make sure that you're comprehensive in the way that you uh, approach things. When I was a lawyer, I was a lawyer for five years, and I did some real estate law, and. If you do real estate, there is a checklist. You know, if you do a lease, a uh, commercial property, there might be 100 provisions in that contract. Well, 90 of them are the same in every contract you draw. 10 of them will differ. Uh, but it's important that you make sure you got all 100 in there. And uh, so the importance of being comprehensive and uh, um, not reinventing the wheel on every deal uh, is, is important also. We talked about Mike Barwis's program uh, down in Port St. Lucie. Beyond the on-field performance, Sandy, we've read in the past years about the importance of diet, exercise, and most importantly, rest. Mickey Calloway has mentioned changing the rest schedules for some of the players, including p potentially using a six-man rotation and what he calls prehab. This sounds similar in many ways to what Greg Pop Popovich does with the uh, San Antonio Spurs. Is statistical-driven health management the next frontier of fielding a winning team? I think health management is, is becoming increasingly important because I think that um, there's a greater and greater recognition of uh, the impact of uh, good nutrition, good health, good sleeping habits on performance. This gets back to something that's new for us uh, this year, but I think, you know, we're more in the vanguard uh, in this area in baseball than most people would give us credit for. But, you know, the key is figuring out how to assess the player's readiness. So, for example, this spring, uh, players would come in in the morning. We had a special uh, <clears throat> device that would get their weight but also would get their level of hydration and a couple of other things. And then at the time that they were they – were, on this device, they would answer four or five questions. How did you sleep last night? You know, do you, do you, are you sore anywhere, et cetera, et cetera. The whole idea was to better assess the preparation of the players and their availability for work. So this year we will have, for every player, they will have a travel pillow. They're also, we've, uh, we've ended up with, uh, over the course of spring training, we, we have like seven or eight different pillow styles you know, hoping that uh, players will take their own pillows with them. The more we can do to enhance those aspects of their daily routine, 
uh, the better off we're going to be. We're looking at uh, the the amount of wa- the the type of water that we so we we provide bottled water, which is not a surprise. But different bottled water has different pH levels, as an example. So the question is, what kind of water are we going to provide them based on the uh, mineral content of uh, the filtered water? And it varies from you know brand to brand. So that's the level of detail. <clears throat> now, will any of that have a material impact on their performance? We don't know. But you know, it's like other things. If you can do a little bit here and a little bit there, we're not going to change our travel patterns. So you know, some teams have considered the idea of like traveling the next day. We can't always travel the next day. A lot gotta, of red eyes in your sport. You got to get to the next city. So, given the limitations that we have, uh, you know, what we, what can we do? Mickey started uh, workouts later in the spring so that we wouldn't have to have players there at uh, you know zero dark thirty. As we mentioned in the earlier, Sandy, uh, baseball and the stock market share a long history. The same stock ticker that revolutionized stock trading was quickly adapted for disseminating baseball scores and statistics. You grew up in Seattle mostly or moving all around? All around. Moved everywhere, yeah. Do you have memories of how you used to sort of ingest stats or data from baseball early on, how you get those scores? When I first got involved with baseball, I was living in Japan. Uh, I was... uh, eight nine eight eight years old and actually this was right after world war ii this was 1955 so 10 years after but uh so i didn't have access to much there when i came back to the states we had our first tv uh i remember watching uh the 56 world series on television but uh quite often i would listen to this was in central illinois so i could listen to the white Sox, the cubs the st louis cardinals games um, so I got a, I, quite a bit of it from the radio. And then trading cards, uh, bubbling up cards were big in those days. And uh, um, I had a pretty extensive, uh, low cost. You still have some collection. of those? Uh, no, the my mother, the one thing that uh, I will forever uh, falter for was uh, while I was away in college, getting rid of my baseball card collection and my stamp collection. I know that nerdy no, we, philatelist. We, we uh, all you know. have those stories. <laughs> Luckily, my my philatelist collection was preserved, but my baseball card collection became kitty litter. Okay, from nineteen seven from the ni- early nineteen seventies. Yeah. All those great cards. Yeah. The average fan sees a few stats on screen for pitchers, fielders, and batters: strike percentage, fielding percentage, batting average, home runs. Here at the New York Stock Exchange, a casual investor will look at what dividends and price equity ratios, but in baseball or investing, there's so much more to it than that. Bring us, Sandy, into the front office of the Mets and give our listeners a few special statistics to keep an eye on in the first 60 days of this season, things that could point to success or failure in October. What should the smart fan really be looking at this for the for April, May, and June? I think that... Uh with respect to pitching, there there are a few, not necessarily in order of importance, but uh, uh, one would be swing and miss rates, you know, uh, and a swing and miss rates generally mean that uh, a, a particular pitch either has uh, a high velocity, um, a large um, sort of deflection, you know, running or or uh, uh, dropping. Um, it may have to do with the spin rate. So spin rates, you know, with, with some of the new uh, technology that we have, we can measure almost everything. And so um, <clears throat> it's not just velocity anymore. It's does the, does the pitch move? And not only can you say that with the naked eye, but you can actually measure it. Are these fan accessible generally? Uh, some of them are, yeah. Uh, so, so spin rates. Now you would think, okay, a curveball, the spin rate on a curveball is, is really important. Well, spin rates on a fastball are too. Because, for example, uh, a higher spin rate tends to make a ball uh, drop less than a low spin rate. If a ball doesn't drop as much, then you're probably better off throwing it high in the strike zone rather than low in the strike zone or starting it in, say, the middle of the strike zone. And if it doesn't drop, then it's a fat pitch. Uh, On the other hand, if, if a ball is dropping, you probably want to stay down with the ball so the ball doesn't start up and then drop into the zone. So a lot of those things come into play, and that's the kind of information we didn't have just a few years ago. 
we made a decision on a player um, a few years ago. We had to decide between Ike Davis uh, and Lucas Duda at first base. And um, we, d- we made the decision based on the exit velocity of their uh, uh, balls off of the bat. And Lucas had a higher exit velocity, which usually translates into a higher batting average. Now, in those days, we didn't have what's now known as the launch angle. So today, it's it's a matter of exit velocity and launch angle. And, um, you know, with so many teams shifting now, um, most teams have decided the best way to attack the shift is to hit over the sh- shift. And uh, that's why there's there's been such a proliferation of home runs because guys are trying to hit the ball in the air. And are these numbers changing subtly month to month either to indicate – growing fatigue in the player or strengthening the player? They can change from inning to inning, and that's where the application becomes more important because if you see a uh, change in the spin rate, change in velocity, uh, change in release point for a pitcher, uh, those things can, can indicate fatigue, and when you have fatigue, you have a higher risk of injury. So <clears throat> it's not just a matter of monitoring that from from game to game, but it can also be very important in game. And so that's where ultimately you want to get is being able to use this information on a real-time in-game basis. After the break, more with Sandy Alderson on the path that took him into baseball and where the sport is headed right after this. Opening weekend at City Field features the Mets Build-A-Bear Teddy Giveaway for the first 15,000 fans in attendance on Saturday, March 31st, and a tote bag giveaway to all fans on Sunday, April 1st, when the Mets take on the Cardinals. For tickets to opening weekend, go to Mets.com slash tickets. Back now with Sandy Alderson, since 2010, the general manager of the New York Mets. You might be surprised to know that today... Only one general manager is a former Major League Baseball player, and only four others even played in the minor leagues. And Sandy will correct me if I'm wrong on that stat. But your career began as a Marine infantry officer in Vietnam before heading to Harvard Law School. That background doesn't portend to 37 years in this game. What drew you from the bar exam to the base path? It was uh, very fortuitous. Uh, I was a practicing lawyer in San Francisco. Um, doing work that I didn't particularly enjoy, um, but was the protege of, a, of another former Marine, uh, Dartmouth College graduate. Um, <clears throat> and he and his father-in-law uh, uh, bought the Oakland A's. And his father-in-law ran um, Levi Strauss, the Haas family. And so I got involved doing legal work uh, for the A's uh, in the first year or so that they owned the team. I did salary arbitrations and a variety of other things. And one day he just asked me if I wanted to come over full time and, and uh, join the A's. And I said, why not? I mean, I can always be a lawyer. That's so, a great uh, call. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't exactly a tough call, but uh, um, you know, and I just went from there. And the thing that uh, at the time, the manager of the Oakland A's was uh, Billy Martin, who's a legendary figure, certainly here in New York, yeah. but elsewhere in baseball also. And, Number uh, one. Uh, so my baptism uh, was uh, uh, with a team under Billy's leadership. Well, when Billy left, he took all of his buddies with him because the whole organization was made up of uh, friends and cronies and drinking buddies of Billy's. So uh, when he left... Uh, Roy Eisenhart, the president of the team, and, and I, and uh, Wally Haas, um, there was really nobody to turn to. And so I think they said, okay, you're it, uh, pointing to me, just because they kind of trusted me, they knew, had known me for a while, um, and uh, that's how I got started on the business, of uh, the baseball side. Now, at that time, there were no other people as general managers who were like me. They were all not necessarily former players, but former minor league general managers, uh, you know, really old school. And uh, it was fascinating at the time, but I was very, very different. Um, Over time, I thought there would be more people like me who would get into the game, more lawyers. But as it turned out, it, 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 it hasn't been lawyers who have, who have come into these roles, but more, 
uh, technicians, analysts, uh, people who are used to using uh, information. I mean, talking about uh, old school, there are these great scenes in Moneyball of Billy Bean squaring off against his scouts uh, for the Oakland A's after succeeding you in that role. It, it's a scene that's probably played out in 29 other front offices at one point or another around the league. What is the current balance between data and human intuition in evaluating a baseball player's talent? I think the balance has gone way over uh, in favor of analytics. I think you have to start with the analytics. And I think that helps to explain what's happened this offseason with so many free agents not getting the contracts they expected. Um, you can look no further than what has become known as the aging curve. And, uh, you know, if you look analytically at the performance of players from the age of 24 or 25 to the age of 35, you see, generally speaking, you know, an overall decline. Um, I think what's happened is that not only are analytics playing an important role, but everybody uses analytics pretty much the same way because math is math. So when you have 30 teams that just say, look, I'm not going to give X amount of dollars to somebody who's 36 or 37 years old, um, and there aren't those outliers uh, who have done it previously because they're now sort of caught up with the rest of uh, um, groupthink, um, things change. So uh, I would say right now there's far more reliance on uh, the analytics than um, – ever before. And at the same time, I think there's a there's an acknowledgement that uh, the more subjective is, is uh, views are important. But for example, advanced scouting, you know, when we're going to play the Cardinals next week, so we advance scout them, we look at all of their players and try to figure out exactly, you know, how they're going to attack us and, and, and vice versa. Well, we used to do that uh, when I first started, we do that with an, an advanced scout, somebody who would actually go watch the Cardinals. Today, we don't do that because we have access to so much more data. So rather than a small sample size where somebody is actually watching uh, the team, um, we're relying on video and data from you know, 10, 20, 30 times more information than would be available to an individual. And it's being processed in a way uh, that makes it more organized and usable. So it's night and day. And that frees up space behind home plate for all those high-paying fans. <laughs> That's right. That's right. There were reports last week that the Yankees and the Red Sox may meet in London in a series in 2019 following the NFL's move across the Atlantic. During your career, I think you've worked with the MLB yeah. on a lot of issues involving international expansion. How is the game doing internationally, and how is uh, all the aspects of the game impacted by events like the World Baseball Classic, the Olympics, and the growth of the game, particularly in Europe? Uh, I was directly involved with international baseball when I was at MLB from 1998 to 2005. One of the greatest experiences of my career was being involved with the Olympic team in 2000 that won the gold medal in Sydney, uh, beating the Cubans in the last uh, in the last game. Incredible experience. It was like a World Series win over a season uh, collapsed down into two a, like a two week period. Yeah. It was uh, it was incredible. Um, I actually don't think baseball is doing enough to uh, expand internationally and. Uh, I tried to persuade baseball to, to, uh, to invest more overseas uh, over that period of time and subsequently. Um, and the Olympics, I think, are incredibly important. You know, the way the Olympics work is that uh, if you're an Olympic sport, you get, uh, you get subsidy from the government. You also get um, distributions from the Olympic movement. So there's money available. If you're not an Olympic sport, not only doesn't anybody really care about it in places like China um, and Europe uh, or even, you know, the Eastern European countries, um, there's no money to promote the game. So while there are a lot of these baseball federations around the world, like a hundred of them, most of them are on, in, on paper only because there's no money. So if you're not in the Olympics – you're a secondary sport, uh, especially if you're a, an emerging sport in some of these countries. 
So getting the game back in the Olympics, and it will be in the Olympics in 2020, is incredibly important. So there is, there is definitely uh, the possibility for disruption of, uh, of the season. You see that with the National Hockey League. You know, they've done it for years, and I think the National Hockey League has benefited tremendously from its involvement in the Olympics. This year they weren't in the Olympics, and uh, it'll be interesting to see whether they decide to go back because um, I think it's a tremendously important uh, platform. But it's interesting. I tried to appeal uh, to, owner, to owners on a couple of different levels, but one, of the, one level was um, uh, franchise value. Hmm. You know, one of the things that, um, that contributes to franchise value is access, the access to capital. And if our sport is not even well known in, in uh, the Middle East or in Russia or some of these other places where there's a concentration of wealth, then, then the sport doesn't have access to that capital. So one of the ways, not that I'm a big capitalist, but one of the ways I thought I could appeal to, uh, to uh, powers that be was say, hey, if we cut ourselves off from world capital because nobody really knows our game, um, it's going to affect franchise values over the long term. I mean, John Henry, no stranger to the UK, owner of Liverpool. Is there a special sort of vision that, that, that Henry or the Steinbrenners have in thinking that the cricketeers in London will have a particular affinity for the Red Sox and the Bronx Bombers somewhere in, at Wembley Stadium? No, all they care about is being first. They, they want to go because it's, uh, it's London. It's not uh, Caracas. It's not, um, you know, Puerto Rico. It's, that's a headliner, you know, playing in Wembley Stadium or what have you, being in London. So they want to go. The nice thing about London, too, is fairly close. Yeah. It's not like going to Japan. So, it's just um, like L.A. in the other direction. Yeah, I think that uh, you know the Mets were very strongly considered, but I, I think, look, the, the cachet of those two franchises at this point, the, not, not just individually, but uh, uh, the rivalry um, will make for good theater in London as it does most places. So I'm, I'm happy they're going. Next city after London that, that Sandy Alderson would pick? Baseball is most popular in the Netherlands. Really? In, in Europe. Uh, part of that is because of uh, the Curacao and some of the, uh, you know, West Indian yep. uh, territories. But baseball has always been popular in the Netherlands. When I was a kid, I was living in, in England, and the only non-U.S. baseball that I was exposed to was in the Netherlands. But there's no, you know, who wants to go play in Rotterdam? So <laughs> uh, there was a lot of talk about playing in Rome. Uh, baseball is fairly popular in Rome. I don't know if you've been to Florence, you know, that, uh, that uh, birthplace of Italian Renaissance art, but they have a baseball team. Uh, so at night, if you're looking at the Duomo, uh, you got to avoid the, uh, the baseball lights, you know, at the ballpark. But, um, but no one can hit a ball against Michelangelo's David and knock off his arm because it's already been done. That's, it's already been done, yeah. It's not, not going to happen again. Uh, you're trying to put a product on the field that fans can enjoy this year in the stands or on television, and a perennial topic in the off season is the pace of play. It's a particular focus for Rob Manfred, the commissioner, but the average game I think remains around three hours, and the pitch clock will be gone in 2018, but mound visits are going to be limited, commercial breaks are going to be shorter. Are we missing something? You've been watching games for four decades. Are there other ways to improve this game that aren't being considered this year? Well, I think the pitch clock is ultimately uh, what will improve the pace of play uh, most efficiently. Uh, but I think the commissioner has decided that uh, given the current relationship between Major League Baseball and the Players Association, that imposing a pitch, a pitch clock, uh, a play clock, um, wasn't appropriate at this time, so I'm I'm the chair of the rules committee. So I you know look at these things. And when I was with MLB in those from '98 to 2005, one of my responsibilities was the pace of play. And I think the key thing is, and this is what MLB is focused on now, is 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 cutting out the dead time. And the way to do it is to do it um, incrementally. So for example, between innings, uh, most games. Uh, there's a two two minute and five second break. Well, the average break time is like two minutes and forty five seconds, or you know, I, I'm guessing there a little bit, but there's a lot of slippage. Um, if we can tighten that up, 
and you take, let's say, 20 seconds times 18, 18. Uh, you're talking about 30, 360 seconds. That's six minutes. So that's just one example of where time can be saved. Um, mound visits, pitching changes, um, they're little things that we can tighten up. Uh, hitters staying in the box. Um, making sure that pitchers through, throw within 15 or 20 seconds is also important, but um, I think we'll probably get there at some point. When I was doing this, I always thought uh, – 245 was about the right length of a game. And the reason is you could say to people, well, the game's a little over two and a half hours. Right. As opposed to, ah, it's a little over three hours. And that People, you know, it's like buying something for 99 cents. It sounds a lot cheaper than something that costs you a buck ten. And, so, and I want to convince my wife to let my kids stay up and yeah. watch. And something in the nine hour is different than something in the ten hour. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, the ironic thing is that especially in the postseason, our best ratings are between 11 and 11.30 at night. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's, there's always the debate over playing games during the day or playing them at night, starting them earlier than later. Um, but our best ratings uh, are typically in that 11, 11.30 time frame when, you know, local news is on and, that, and the games are ending and so forth. So... Um, there are a lot of different considerations. Well, it's getting late uh, in here in the Ice House as well, and I want to end our conversation, Sandy, with a quick flashback to the early highlight of your career, San Francisco 1989, Dennis Eckersley on the mound for the A's against the Giants. Let's have a trip back down memory lane. A clean 4-0 sweep, yeah. uh, but not before an earthquake disrupted the fall pageant. <laughs> if there are a few keys to the 2018 Mets achieving that same kind of triumph this year, what are they going to be? Good leadership from uh, Mickey and, and the coaching staff. Um, a commitment from every player uh, to every other player as a teammate. Um, some good luck. Every, every team needs a little bit of luck. But um, I'm really excited about the season. And uh, as I look back on, you know, that season, uh, 1989, it wasn't all roses that whole uh, season. Um, but uh, uh, persevered because of great characters like Dave Stewart, Eckersley. The thing about that team, and I think we have a little bit of that as well uh, with the current Mets team, it was a great team to watch, a bunch of characters. People hated to play us. They hated to lose to us. The, the most fun was going into another ballpark and, you know, kicking their butts and uh, walking out because they just disliked all the personalities that we had. Ricky Henderson, he could get under your skin. Jose Canseco, Eckersley. Uh, we got a few characters like that on this team. Uh, Cespedes. Um, uh, you know, Gonzalez, he could come back and... Well, Adrian, Adrian's not really... Um, you know, a character in, uh, you know, a theatrical sense. He's, uh, he's a very solid player. But uh, we have some interesting storylines. And, uh, of course, they don't mean anything if you don't win. Can't wait to see it. Good luck against the Cardinals. All right. Thanks very much. Enjoyed it. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Sandy Alderson, general manager of the New York Mets. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a question or a comment you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at NYSE. Our show is produced by Pete Ash and Ian Wolf with production assistance from Ken Abel and Steve Portner. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the library of the New York Stock Exchange. Let's go Mets, play ball. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties expressed or implied as to the accuracy or completeness of this information and do not sponsor, approve or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to buy any security or recommendation of any security or trading practice. 